Before we uh, eventually get into the Advent season, we're going to be spending uh, a few weeks in Matthew chapter 5 and uh, in what is called uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. But as we begin to look at this chapter, I want to talk about a podcast I've been listening to that's about the story of Mars Hill, Seattle, and their pastor, Mark Driscoll. Uh, The podcast titled The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill seeks to understand what happened when Mars Hill Church in Seattle exploded in growth only for it to disband seemingly just as quickly in 2014. I've found this podcast to be an excellent journalistic project put out by Christianity Today, trying to speak to the truth of what went wrong. And I have to admit there's some distant but personal connection to the story. As a young pastor, I attended conferences where Mark Driscoll spoke, and in all honesty, Mark's fame in pastor circles introduced me to the realities of Seattle and the idea of ministering in Washington State. There are many important lessons and warnings to be learned from this sad story, but there's one particular theme that weaves itself through the whole story that I want you to that I want to draw our attention to this morning. Mark was and is a very skilled communicator. In the years that he was at the church, the church grew numerically into a mega church from a church plant. But there was one particular fatal flaw in the system, and that was this. Mark did not have the maturity of character to support the growth of the church and the growth of his brand and celebrity status. Mark could draw a crowd. Mark was well known across the country. And the fame and the numerical success caused many in the church to ignore sinful behavior and to have a the ends justify the means mentality that enabled sinful behavior and ultimately led to the implosion of the church. It is a sad reminder of what the Bible clearly tells us, that character matters. And today as we begin looking at the Sermon on the Mount, it's important to see how Jesus begins this very important sermon that is at the center of a lot of Christian practice throughout the generations. It's important to notice that Jesus begins by speaking about the character of that people in his kingdom will have. And as we study Jesus' words, I want us to see the character that we are to have as followers of Jesus and the importance of cultivating character. So let's look, let's begin Matthew chapter 5. We're going to begin by looking at verses 1 and 2 that sort of set the stage both for our passage today, but also the larger section of Matthew 5 through 7. So let's look at verses 1 to 2. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Jesus was often surrounded by crowds of people. And on this occasion, as with other times, when Jesus is around people, he begins to teach them. But in addition to this pattern of Jesus as teacher, one of the neat features of Matthew is how in the background of what Jesus does is this echo of Jesus presented as repeating the history of Israel. Let me give you one example. The Israelites wandered in the wilderness for 40 years and faced and failed temptations to rebel against God. But in Matthew chapter 4, we read that Jesus wandered in the wilderness for 40 days and remained faithful to God in the midst of temptation. Temptation. 
where God uses the circumstances of Israel's failure and shows them as Jesus succeeding as being in one sense a new Israel. Here in the Sermon on the Mount, we can see echoes of Jesus repeating another story of the Old Testament. And that is the story of God giving the Ten Commandments to Moses from Mount Sinai. If you want to read that, you can read Exodus chapter 19 through chapter 31. In short summary, Moses goes up the mountain where God gives him the law and then he takes it down to the people. But here, in Jesus' reenactment of this, we see that Jesus takes both the role of God and Moses in this story. He will be both the God who gives the law and the mediator who communicates that law to the people. He is both the God who commands his people and the one mediator between God and man. With this background, we can see chapters 5 through 7 of Matthew as Jesus teaching his people what it means to live in his kingdom. So through faith, we are in Jesus, we are reconciled to God, and then we live out the rest of our lives under the reign of King Jesus. So let's now move, with that as our background, let's move to the next part that gets into this idea of Christian character, of values that Jesus demands of his people. Now, as we saw last week in Psalm 41, the beginning of Matthew 5 repeats this phrase, blessed are, and you can see that pretty clearly in your Bible there. In each phrase, there's a description of character or the manner in which someone lives and displays that character. And as I mentioned earlier, I think it's important to see that this is where Jesus begins. Jesus begins with character. Of all the things he could have began with, he begins here. But we also need to see that the person who lives in this way will experience the blessing of God. And for our purposes, when we think of that word blessing, we talked a little bit about this last week, but I want us to think of it this way, of living a life that is approved of by God or rewarded by God. This is what it means to live a life that is pleasing to God. Before we get into the specifics, the other, things that, the other thing that I want you to notice by way of introduction that we'll come back to again and again is in some ways how countercultural this list is. And I want us to see in part that the character activity and the values described here are not necessarily the values of our larger American culture, the business world, or the world of celebrity. And one of the themes that I want us to see here is how differently we are called to live than this world lives. So with that being said, let's go to the first beatitude, the first statement in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, as with some of these, we need to do some definitional work here. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? One author defines it this way, that poverty of spirit is the personal acknowledgement of spiritual bankruptcy. It is the conscious confession of unworthiness before God. And as we'll see in each one, where there is a blessing on the person who lives this way, there is also the reward. So the reward for being poor in spirit is participation in the kingdom of heaven. Now how do we enter God's kingdom? How do we receive the future blessing of the kingdom of heaven? 
And the reward then helps us understand what it means to be poor in spirit. To become a citizen of God's kingdom and to have the future blessing of eternal life, a person must repent of their sins and place their faith in Christ. But a person will not repent and a person will not place their faith in Jesus unless they have humbled themselves before God. I think central to being poor in spirit is being humble before God. It is the acknowledgement that I have no spiritual riches to pay God for entrance into the kingdom. I have nothing that God needs from me to barter my way into salvation. It is only when we realize our spiritual bankruptcy that we will humble ourselves before the Lord in repentance and faith. And when we do that, when we acknowledge our spiritual poverty, then we will have a place in the kingdom of heaven. I think it's important to note here that in Jesus beginning with this, again, of all the places he could start, he starts here with humility. So much of what flows in the rest of this section of the text, I think, flows out of a humble heart. God's people are to be a humble people. God's people are a people reliant on God's grace. There is no place for pride or privilege or entitlement in the kingdom of heaven. We will be able to say similar things about what follows, but I want to pause here and mention here that our world, if we're honest with ourselves, our world does not value being poor in spirit. No one has ever said about their favorite politician or celebrity, you know that that guy really acknowledges his spiritual bankruptcy and unworthiness before the Lord. But while our world, again, if we're honest with ourselves, if our world doesn't value it, and we don't really value it, we need to see that Jesus values this. As we go through this list with each example, there needs to be this place for evaluation of do I have the same values as Jesus? And it might might not need to be said, but if my values are different than Jesus' values, then I'm the one who needs to change. If you are honest about your sinfulness and your need for grace, you will be rewarded with a place in the kingdom of Jesus. Let's go to the next beatitude there in in verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. There's some debate in the commentaries about what type of mourning we're talking about here. And some of which you'll see in the different statements, there's a broadness that I think can act as a larger category for many aspects of the different words. There's a sense in which there is a broad promise that if you belong to Jesus and you mourn, you can count on the comfort of Jesus. So we think of a great passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. It seems to me that the blessing comes in finding comfort, not in what this world gives us to self-medicate, but to turn to the Lord for comfort. 
that the only place you can know you will receive comfort from is from the Lord. A life of indulgence and sin, money, substances cannot take away your pain. Only in Jesus can you find comfort. There's also a sense that this mourning can refer specifically to mourning over our sin. It's connecting a verse like this to a verse like Psalm 119, verses 136. My, tear, my eyes shed streams of tears because people do not keep your law. There is a specific place in the life of the believer to mourn our sin. Because it is only when we mourn our sin that we repent of our sin. And it is only when we repent of our sin that we receive the comfort of forgiveness. So do you mourn? Do you mourn in a way that directs your grief towards God and his comfort? Do you mourn your sin in such a way that drives you to confession and the comfort of forgiveness? This is the life that is pleasing to God. Again, this is a great example to draw a contrast between the life we are called to and the life of those who have rejected Jesus. This is not what an unbelieving world values. It does not value mourning and finding comfort in the Lord. It does not value mourning sin and finding the comfort of forgiveness. And again, it bears mentioning, do our values more reflect our culture or Jesus? The citizens of Jesus' kingdom bring their sadness to the Lord and mourn their sin, and they find the blessing of comfort. Let's go to the next one in verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meek is another word, generally speaking, that speaks to humility. Though in other contexts, like the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, it can also be translated gentle or gentleness. And so we see here that the meek, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. In one sense, this is a completely ridiculous statement. It is the mighty warriors who conquer the earth. It is the forceful and violent empires of this world that capture the earth. In one sense, to say that the meek shall inherit the earth makes no sense. But in God's kingdom, might does not make right. Some commentators connect this with Psalm 37. For the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. And the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. If you want to receive the blessing of God and the blessings of a new earth and a new heavens, you must be meek. These blessings are not conquered, they are given. Notice the language of inheritance in verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. If we are meek, we will receive the blessing of God like an inheritance, unearned. Think of it this way. In God's kingdom, the meek, the gentle, and humble are the ones who will be victorious. Not because they are victorious, but because their God is victorious and he will give them blessing. Let's go on to verse 6 for the next statement there. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. We have in verse 6 this metaphor of eating and drinking. And not to brag, but I'm really good 
at eating. And so most of my attempts at healthy living tend to leave me feeling hungry. And I think that this can help us understand the strength of desire for righteousness that Jesus' followers will have. Those who are blessed by the Lord have a strong desire for righteousness that is compared to the strong desire for food and drink. It is only when we pursue righteousness, in fact, that we will be satisfied. We're also helped in this world pi- word picture because hunger and thirst represent basic functions of our body. So not only does it communicate the strength of that desire, that pursuit, it communicates the necessity of that pursuit. To live, you must eat and drink. And again, this is more true in a world without grocery stores and Costco's. Okay, the idea of any of us starving is probably pretty rare. But in a world without Costco, back in the time of Jesus, it was actually more of a danger and the scarcity of food. So for them, it truly was a matter of life and death. By the way, that's why gluttony is such a big deal. Because your gluttony could actually kill somebody. But that's another sermon for another time. The one who is blessed by God is the one who needs to pursue righteousness like we pursue food to live. Just like food and water for the follower of Jesus, righteousness is essential. It is not optional. But what is this righteousness that he's referring to? Again, I think one of the commentators is helpful here. He says this, These people hunger and thirst, not only that they may be righteous, that is that they may wholly do God's will from the heart, but that justice may be done everywhere. Because it's not further defined, as I mentioned before, it seems best to understand righteousness here in the full range of the word. So God's people are to find satisfaction in living a righteous life. A life of sin will not satisfy you. But to find satisfaction, you must pursue righteousness like your food, like your life depends on it. But also we must understand this as God's people must hunger and thirst for justice, that sense of righteousness. We must rejoice when the truth comes out. We live in a world that values justice for those we disagree with or those we don't like. God's people need to be people who hunger for justice whether or not that justice is executed against those they agree with and who are, quote, on their side. We are a people who personally pursue righteousness and love to see God's justice done no matter who receives that justice. Let's move on to the next phrase in verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Again, it's helpful to define our terms. As one author defines mercy here, mercy embraces both forgiveness for the guilty and compassion for the suffering and needy. And because the emphasis is on the character of God's people, the character of being merciful leads to receiving mercy. Now, we could also think of it the other way around. In one sense, we are only merciful when we understand that we have received mercy. It is only when we humble ourselves and understand that we need mercy that we will then show mercy to others. In fact, I would go so far as to say that when we refuse to show mercy, it often shows that we don't think we need any of that mercy for ourselves. 
And that's one of the most spiritually dangerous places you can be, is not understanding your complete reliance on the mercy of God. When we don't understand the mercy of God, we will not be merciful to others. We will not forgive, and we will not have compassion for the suffering and the needy. But God's people are to be merciful. As those who have experienced the mercy of God, God's people are people who are forgivers of others. God's people are those who have great compassion for the needy. And even when being merciful is not seen as a strength, it is when we show mercy that we experience God's mercy and blessing. Again, it's easy to see how this is not always valued by the outside culture. Again, when was the last time a politician ran on, look how merciful I am. But again, while the outside culture may not value it, those who belong to the kingdom of Jesus must. Let's go to the next statement in verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Again, as you're sort of expecting now, there's some debate as to how do we understand pure in heart. Some take it as a reference to moral purity and others take it as a reference to having a single-minded commitment to Jesus. But there's obviously overlap here. When we are serious in our devotion to God and his commands, we will live without hypocrisy and will seek to live a life of purity and righteousness. All believers are called to live a life of purity and holiness. As Jesus will say later in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. We are to pursue holiness just as God is holy. And if this is our single-minded commitment, then we can understand how that it is those who live like this shall see God if you understand that you are to live a life of purity, then you will pursue God in all that he is and you will in faith follow him, which brings with it the hope of eternal life where you will see God. At the same time, as you pursue purity, you will recognize how impure you actually are and will see your need for a Savior who forgives you and makes you pure before God. And when you understand how much you have been forgiven, it will drive you to further pursue purity as gratitude to God for your salvation. When you reach out in faith, you will see that it is only through faith in Jesus that you can be made pure and have the hope of eternal life. And when the world calls you to the impurity of sin, blessed are those who defy that call and pursue the purity of God in integrity and faith. Let's go to the next phrase in verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. God's people must be people who make peace. God's people must be agents of reconciliation. And when we do so, Jesus says, we shall be called sons of God. This is a way to express someone's character and activity. It comes from the cultural fact that especially at that time in human history, people did what their parents did. So if your dad was a shepherd, you became a shepherd. When we are peacemakers, we are, in a sense, acting like God, our Father. We're acting like his sons and daughters. Living like God, our Father, must include living like a peacemaker. But what does that look like in our lives? 
and to come at it from a different direction, let's think about what it means to not be a peacemaker. There are probably as many different ways to get it wrong as there are people, but a lot of it has to do with our individual responses to conflict. In the book Resolving Everyday Conflict by author Ken Sandy, he gives us this helpful memory device of what it means not to be a peacemaker. He says we want to be peacemakers, not peace fakers, who avoid and ignore the problem, nor do we want to be peace breakers who attack those in conflict and are overly aggressive. Here's part of the problem. All of us have a different bias. All of us have one that we normally choose. Is it more likely that you want to sweep the conflict under the rug? Or would you rather just go at someone until they give you what they want, what you want? But a peacemaker both speaks the truth, but does so in a loving way. When we pursue peace, when we speak truthfully and lovingly to each other, and when we seek to reconcile differences, then we will be called sons and daughters of God. Last one in our list. I know it's been a long list. Thanks for sticking with me. We have the persecuted in verses 10 to 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. What's different about this phrase is we have the beatitude in verse 10, and then there's sort of this expansion on it in verses 11 and 12. But again, we see Jesus turning the tables of our expectations. That the ones who will receive the kingdom of heaven, the ones that will be victorious, are those who are persecuted and oppressed. The people who lose are the ones who will win. But we must notice how this persecution is described. It is persecution, quote, for righteousness' sake, and unquote, Jesus' account It is so important to understand that the persecution that is in view is not because we've done anything wrong, but because we are faithfully faithfully following Jesus. Sometimes we suffer persecution because we're being jerks. Jesus calls us to live such a righteous life that the only thing someone can say against you is that you follow Jesus. But if you are persecuted for following Jesus, you will experience his blessing. You will be blessed even, as we see in verse 11, even when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely. Even when you are beaten down by those around you, you can rejoice and be glad. Why? Two reasons. First reason Jesus gives, your reward is great in heaven. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. We do not live for the approval of other people. We live for the approval of Jesus. When we do not live like the people of this world, we will not always be treated well. We will not be rewarded by the people of this world for following Jesus, but Jesus sees, and Jesus will reward his people for their faithfulness. But secondly, in addition to the heavenly rewards promised by Jesus, we also see that if we suffer for righteousness' sake, we are in really good company. Look at the end of verse 12. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, 
for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You can have peace and joy even when people utter all kinds of evil against you because they did the same thing to Isaiah, Elijah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and all the other prophets. If you are faithful to Jesus, even if you are demonized and slandered in this world, there is some comfort in knowing that followers of Jesus experienced this throughout history. You're in good company. Things turned out all right for Ezekiel. You got a whole book of the Bible and he is with his Savior today. <laughs> and if somebody hates me and hates Ezekiel, I feel pretty good about being with Ezekiel. Ezekiel. Because the promise is the same for us. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. A couple thoughts as we conclude this morning. And these are going to be more broad, again, with, with, with all the different details in this one. But the first question I want to ask you is, are these values a priority in your life? Central to being a follower of Jesus is living a life of godly character. To quote the title of the book that the elders and I just finished on the fruit of the Spirit, character matters. We need to recognize the centrality of godly character in the life of a believer. We see it placed at the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, we think of the well-known passages like the fruit of the Spirit. And we think that outside of the skill of teaching, the qualifications for elders are character-based. And in fact, we could apply everything here to Jesus himself. Even though he was the Son of God incarnate, he was humble, meek, merciful, persecuted, pure, righteous, a peacemaker. He mourned all down the line. In fact, that might be a neat study for you, either in your small group or on your own, of finding examples of Jesus living these out. So are these what you value? And that leads to the second question, are your values more shaped by your culture or by Jesus? We noticed again and again how the values described here are not necessarily valued by our world. Do you look for these values in the people you follow or are influenced by? And do you give the effort to pursue these values in your own life? And finally, just by way of summary, is there a specific beatitude that's speaking to your heart right now? There's so many things to be said about this passage of Scripture and there's so many aspects of the Christian life covered here. And it's truly foundational to living out our faith. But one of the things of preaching is that each of us needs to take time to consider what God is saying to us personally through this passage of Scripture. And so I just want to bring that to the forefront here of is there a specific beatitude, a specific phrase here that God is impressing on your heart today? Would you make a note of that in your notes? Would you think about that as you drive home or as you're in small group over the next couple of weeks? Friends, as we we'll continue to look through the Sermon on the Mount. I want us to begin with this idea of godly character at the center of everything we do. And that before we get to some of the commands that come later, that we would begin by pursuing godliness in everything that we do. That we would not pursue the blessing and approval of 
of this world, but the blessing and approval of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the Beatitudes. We thank you for the commands of Jesus to live in a way that is approved by and pleasing to you. That we would walk in your blessing as we live out these godly values. That we would be humble, that we would be merciful, that we would pursue righteousness and holiness. God, that you would speak to our hearts about what you are calling us to through your word today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching this video from Hillside Evangelical Free Church. Our hope is that these resources will help you grow as a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. We're located in Green Bank, Washington on Whidbey Island. And if you live in the area and are looking for a church home, we'd love to have you join us. You can find out more information at our website at hillside-efc.com.